सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली were marked with an n for emperor napoleon bonaparte of france and an a for alexander pavlovich tsar of russia king frederick william the 3rd of prussia who had lost the battle that led to the meeting didn't get a tent and had to suffer the sight of napoleon flirting with his wife duchess louise of mecklenburg strelitz the grand gathering of world leaders in new delhi this coming weekend draws its lineage from that meeting of emperors at tilsit among the first modern diplomatic summits do multilateral leadership summits form an ever greater part of modern diplomacy the record of what these gatherings have actually achieved isn't inspiring is the time coming for everyone to just start switching to zoom instead maybe and i'm not joking even as napoleon and alexander plotted the division of europe during long nighttime walks english spies lurked around them historian j holland rose has revealed england's intelligence led the east india company to strengthen its presence along the northwest borders of india and prepare for atlantic battles that would give the prussians their revenge just a few years later failure diplomatic historian jan melison has ruefully recorded did not deter presidents and prime ministers from their unabated love of the summit the practice of summitry has become an addictive drug for many political principles the summit meeting is in some critical senses an artifact of technology for generations the lack of secure roads and reliable maps simply didn't allow heads of state to meet directly Thus diplomatic communication was conducted through traders friars and imperial envoys Franciscan monks who visited Mongol courts in the 13th century variously pushed for an alliance with the French emperor Louis the 9th and sought out means to conquer the golden horde that's what diplomacy is still all about it's just that we don't do it in quite the same way the Mughal emperor Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar did not seek a summit meeting after the women of his court were expelled from Mecca in 1850 historian N R Farooqi's work shows instead he quietly plotted with the portuguese to harass turkish ottoman shipping in the indian ocean franklin delano roosevelt who served as the united states president from 1933 to 1945 was a great believer in summit diplomacy and used it extensively during the course of the second world war scholar elmer plishke notes five of his predecessors though never once set foot on foreign soil foreign affairs were seen as the jobs of generals or adventurers or diplomats not political leaders the coming of the steam train and the turbo prop engine after that fueled the delusion that diplomacy could be more effectively conducted as a kind of meeting between gentlemen at their favorite club If you want to settle a thing you see your opponent and talk it over with him said David Lloyd George Britain's prime minister from 1916 to 1922 The last thing you want to do is write him a letter even though it's clear that many professional diplomats weren't easily beguiled by charm or force of personality politicians were often seduced In 1939 British prime minister Neville Chamberlain infamously held up an agreement with the German Führer Adolf Hitler recording and i quote the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again was it worth a lot that letter new scholarship of course tells us chamberlain was buying time for military preparation but played his hand without understanding how unprepared germany was for war too in his eagerness to avoid war he ended up signaling to the germans that they could get away if they move fast and first 
for all the failures though, the seduction of being seen as the victors of the Second World War led to the great Potsdam Conference of 1945, where leaders of the Soviet Union, the United States and Great Britain met to decide on the new world order. That the great power blocks had begun to descend into the Cold War within two years of Potsdam is a cautionary tale about what straight-talking guys can achieve in rooms. Emerging from the carnage of 1939-1945, new multilateral institutions were set up to manage the peace. There was, of course, the United Nations, family of organizations, you know, the General Assembly, the Security Council, and the so-called Bretton Woods organizations like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. From early on though, Moscow concluded that the West was actually working to create a hostile bloc in Europe to contain its power. Historian Jeffrey Roberts has explained. All the cigar smoking camaraderie at Potsdam and Yalta pretty soon evaporated. It did not iron out the fundamental differences of ideology and interests over how geopolitical power ought to be shared and competition managed. The Bretton Woods system itself collapsed in the 1960s, economist Harold James has shown, because of the US monetary expansion to fund the Vietnam War, leading up to an exchange rate crisis in 1971. Following the global energy crisis that erupted after the Arab-Israeli War of 1973, Western leaders again felt the need for a transnational system. That March, the finance ministers of four industrialized economies, that is the US, France, Britain and Germany, with Japan joining later, created the so-called Library Group. The Library Group grew in Italy in 1974 and Canada in 1976, becoming the Group of Seven or G7. The group also invited newly post-Soviet Russia to join in 1997 only to expel it after the initial invasion of Ukraine. Leaders of the G7 had common interests, integrated economies and sheltered under the United States nuclear weapons security guarantee. To coordinate their actions was relatively easy. As the G7 expanded though and grew into the G20 in 1999, beginning with a meeting of finance ministers in Berlin, the issues became more and more complex. For all practical purposes, international relations scholars Andrew F. Cooper and Vincent Puillot argue that G20 became a stage for competing oligarchies, if you like. The countries of the West on the one hand and the China-Russia axis on the other. Leaders more concerned about outcomes than photo ops might learn some useful lessons from Tilsit. Within weeks of the barge party, Napoleon was obstructing Russian interests in the Balkans. For his part, Tsar Alexander ended a blockade meant to choke Britain's Baltic and Russian trade. Finally, in 1812, Napoleon embarked on a disastrous war with Russia, which ended finally with Alexander kicking open the gates of Paris two years later. The hugs and the handshakes and the kisses came to absolutely nothing. All through the Cold War, low-profile professional diplomacy often proved more effective than summitry. The results were predictable. President John F. Kennedy's summit meeting with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna in 1961 ended up only serving to deepen their mutual dislike. Leadership misjudgments and suspicions, historian Serhi Plokhi has shown, led both politicians to walk into near-catastrophic traps. Eventually, discreet, behind-the-scenes work allowed a deal to be hammered out involving the removal of short-range nuclear weapons from both Cuba and Turkey. British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's faith in his own charisma led him to eschew a translator during a summit with French President Charles de Gaulle in 1962. The misunderstandings that followed led France to veto Britain's first application for entry to the European Economic Community. And one much-advertised summit success, President Richard Nixon's Cold War shaping meeting with China's Mao Zedong in 1972 could only become a PR event because of a convergence of strategic interests hammered out in the course of months of secret diplomacy. As German diplomatic historian Peter Wehlemann has noted, summit-driven diplomacy has led to superficial understandings that in the long term actually aggravate differences. 
heads of state, he writes, are not experts in highly complex matters such as arms control, trade or other issues on summit agendas. In a world where encrypted digital communications enable leaders to speak instantly and securely, and where experts are on hand to work behind the scenes to resolve complex issues, there is no apparent purpose left to summits except pageantry. Leaders may like to show their domestic audiences that they have status and prestige with their global peers and are working to resolve intractable problems like climate change or economic crisis. This is, however, a kind of ersatz glory, funded by taxpayers and not serving very useful ends. The larger a summit, in fact, the less likely it is to yield any genuinely useful outcome because more countries mean more discordant voices. A world without drums and bugles and fancy dress dinners will without a doubt be a duller one. But perhaps it will also be one where some things will actually get done. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print. Thank you for watching Security Code.